So welcome to the first webinar in the Canadian Wildlife Federation's iNaturalist CSI, Canadian Species Identification Series. Each month this summer, we will explore how to take identifiable photos and make identifications of wildlife on iNaturalist Canada. In honor of World Turtle Day yesterday, this webinar is all about making better observations and identifications of turtles, presented by David Seaburn our freshwater turtle specialist at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. My name is Caitlin Brandt and I am the digital iNaturalist technician at CWF. I'm gonna do a quick introduction, some housekeeping before passing it over to Dave. So this webinar will be recorded and available online. The easiest way to find it is to search in Google CWF webinars. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel as well. So for this webinar, we'll be using the chat to paste some useful resources and links as we go along. And for you as an audience, please use this for any technical issues, audio or video problems that you have, and we'll try and help um, guide through them. In general, if you're having problems, the easiest way sometimes is to just leave the webinar and come back. Uh, for questions, we're gonna use the Q&A feature. So it should be at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it says Q&A and has a little bubble. Any questions you have throughout, put them in there. And at the end, we'll, we'll go through as many questions as we can. We won't be able to get to raised hand due, the time, due to the time limit uh, and the number of participants. So finally, CWF is one of Canada's largest conservation organizations undertaking projects and conservation across the country. Our mission is to conserve and inspire the conservation of Canada's wildlife and habitats. And we do this in a number of ways. One is through engaging the public in youth and citizen science, like iNaturalist Canada, edu education programs like Wild Outside and the Canadian Conservation Corps. We also do specific projects in freshwater, marine and terrestrial environments, many of which target species at risk, like the right whale, the blending turtle, which I'm sure we'll hear about today, uh, at-risk bats and the monarch butterfly. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Dave talk about turtles. Thanks, Caitlin, and uh, thanks everyone for attending our webinar today. So today I'm going to be talking about turtles and how to identify turtles in the field, how to take better observations, why those observations are important, and uh, just some tidbits about turtles and different ways we can take observations that are of value in iNaturalist. So to start with, well, to start with, my screen will not advance. There we go. <laughs> so in Canada, We've got eight species of freshwater turtles. So compared to a number of other taxonomic groups, identifying turtles is fairly straightforward, you know, compared to birds or flowering plants or things like that. So I'm going to go through the eight species of native species of freshwater turtles we've got and point out a few things about identifying those species in the field or from photographs. So the, the painted turtle is the most widespread turtle species in Canada. It's found in British Columbia in the West, all across Canada, right up to the Maritimes. So it's the species that uh, most people have seen if they've seen a turtle in the wild. As you can see here, it has some red markings at the edge of the top shell. Not all painted turtles have as much red. There's a lot of variation among individuals, and that's true for most species. Uh, autumn photograph is also a painted turtle, and you can see there's almost no red on the margin of that shell, but it's the same species. You can see a bit of red in the bottom photograph around the neck and the legs, and that's one reason they're called painted turtles. It looks like the turtle has been painted. Compared to other species of turtles, it's a fairly flat shell, and that's one feature which can be used to help identify it. And it's not a very large turtle. So the maximum size um, in eastern Canada 
is around 13 or 14 centimeters. In Western Canada, they can get bigger than that. Um, so that is a, a factor to keep in mind. We also have the mighty snapping turtle, which is probably our second most common species in Canada um, and our largest species of freshwater turtle. Uh, sometimes you can see that the turtle has these three ridges down the back of the shell, but oftentimes uh, the shell is covered with algae, which makes it very difficult to actually see things like that. So that isn't always a useful feature for identifying the species. The large size and the kind of dinosaur look of the turtle really helps identifying it as a, a snapping turtle. But also there is the dinosaur-like tail with spikes on the tail. You see that it's definitely a snapping turtle. The Blandings turtle is uh, uh, widespread in eastern Canada, and it has the bright yellow neck and throat, which is very, very diagnostic. But oftentimes the turtle may be shy and pull its head in, so you don't have that feature for identification. It does have a series of speckles or freckles or spots on the shell, but again, these are highly variable among individuals. So you can see in the bottom shell, there are still little speckles of color on the shell, but they're much harder to see than in the top individual. I would guess that the, the Blanding's turtle in the bottom photograph is much older. And this is a fairly large turtle, uh, and that also can help identify it. But of course, there are juveniles and young adults which are going to be smaller in size. We have the northern map turtle, again, a species for eastern Canada. And it has a series of faint lines on the top shell, which you can see in the top photograph. And to some people, this looks like lines on a topographic map. And that's where the common name comes from, the map turtle. The, uh, the map turtle also has a ridge which runs down the center of the shell. We can call that a keel, like you might find on the bottom of a boat. And that helps to separate uh, map turtles from painted turtles, which have a vaguely similar shaped uh, shell. Another big difference is the, are the serrations at the rear margin of the map turtle shell. A painted turtles can have a very smooth shell at the back. And of course, the map turtle gets bigger up to 25 up to 25 centimeters in size and the head of a, paint, a, a map turtle is much more massive looking compared to a painted turtle and last but not least the, the map turtle doesn't have the patterns of red on the edge of the shell or on the limbs or neck it does have yellow lines on the throat uh, which the painted turtle can have as well And there's the stink pot or musk turtle. This is a fairly rare or cryptic species. It doesn't bask out of the water up on logs or hummocks like painted turtles do. So it's rarely seen by people. Typically, the, uh, the musk turtle has these two light colored lines on the face and one above and one through the eye. But this is somewhat variable as well. And you can see in the photo on the top that there is kind of a faint line here. The top line maybe is present, but it's kind of hard to see. But the shell is highly domed compared to most species of turtles. Um, it's also highly aquatic. Um, and it's a very small turtle, it's certainly will fit into the palm of your hand. So a large musk turtle was only 12 centimeters in shell length, which is quite small. We have the very bizarre looking uh, spiny soft shell turtle, which unlike our other species of turtles in Canada, it does not have the hard 
rigid shell, but the shell actually is quite flexible. Um, in addition to that, there is the long nose of the spiny soft shell. This allows it to, to nestle in shallow water and leave the tip of its nose above the water, kind of like a snorkel, allowing the turtle to breathe but remain hidden underwater. It's also a species for from big water, so big rivers and lakes. So you're not going to find it in marshes or ponds for the most part. And so the habitat can help identify species as well. And it is also one of our largest species. And that also is a, a big factor for identifying it. In addition, there's the spotted turtle, probably our rarest species in Canada. Like the Blanding's turtle, it has spots on its shell, but instead of many small flecks, it typically has larger and fewer polka dots on the shell, and also, as you can see, on the head. And the species can vary a bit as well. The shell is typically very dark in color. Uh, the spots typically are pretty robust, but sometimes can be quite faint. Um, and the big difference between a spotted turtle and a Blandings is that the Blandings would have the bright yellow neck and throat. Whereas the spotted turtle, it's more of an orangey light brown in females and a dark brown or dark black in adult males. And this is also uh, a very small turtle, but the same size as the musk turtle, and so a bit smaller than a pita turtle. And typically it's only found in fens, bogs, or uh, very, very shallow water wetlands. You're not going to find it in a, a typical marsh or swamp that likes very shallow water. Last but not least, in terms of our native species, is the wood turtle. And it's called the wood turtle because in some people's minds, uh, the top shell looks like it might have been carved out of wood. Instead of a very smooth top shell, the um, individual scutes, so these sections here, are, are pyramidal in shape. So the shell itself has this three-dimensional texture to it which is very, uh, very unusual. Wood turtles are also a fairly rare species in Canada. They're typically found in association with rivers or streams that have a sandy or gravelly bottom. And uh, most areas simply don't have that kind of habitat. It's a fair sized turtle uh, and they can wander a fair distance from water. Um, but the raised shell is going to be the main feature for identifying the wood turtle. Of course, there are not just native species of turtles that we might find when we're out uh, making observations in iNaturalist. The red-eared slider is actually quite abundant in many parts of Canada. Uh, which is unfortunate. It is the common pet store turtle. Um, people buy them the size of a hatchling, so the size of a toony or a loony. If the turtle survives, it gets bigger, and it can get to be 20 or 30 centimeters in the top shell length, which is quite large, which makes it difficult to maintain in captivity. And hence, many people will release them into the wild. So they're pretty common in urban wetlands in many parts of Canada. Uh, they're called red-eared sliders because of the red stripe on the side of the head on both sides, more or less where the ear would be. It's important to point out though that not all red-eared sliders will have that red stripe, um, particularly as the turtle ages, um, the red stripe may fade. So a turtle with a dark head might not have the red stripe, but it still might be a red-eared slider. Uh, there are also a few other non-native species that have been found in Canada, including other species of map turtles, other species of soft-shell turtles. Um, so you have to be very careful making observations not to assume that what you're seeing is obviously a painted turtle or 
obviously the spiny soft shell as opposed to a different kind of soft shell. To give you a sense of how widespread the slider is, um, here's a map I pulled off of iNaturalist. And you can see this is most of Southern Ontario and uh, there are observations of sliders from the Windsor area, uh, quite a few in the Toronto area, um, as far north as the Ottawa area and uh, even over towards Montreal as well. And uh, not to leave out the West Coast, uh, sliders are very common around the Vancouver and Victoria area. It's a warm climate and uh, it seems to be pretty conducive to sliders. And there's um, uh, some evidence that they're breeding in the Vancouver area as well as um, in southwestern Ontario. So we've got eight species of native turtles in Canada, and all of them, all eight species, are now listed as species at risk by the federal government under the Species at Risk Act, or SARA for short. And because of this, um, observations of turtles are valuable um, to help us to document the distribution of the species and, and, and trends what's going on on the landscape. So I just wanted to stress that up front that all our species of turtles are at risk and they need our help. So I have gone through hundreds and hundreds of observations of turtles and iNaturalist trying to identify them where possible. And I've come across a few common issues that have made it difficult to ID some observations. Most observations are pretty straightforward and the photographs are very, very good. So I put together um, a number of tips, we'll say, on how to improve um, the photographs. And these are all photographs from uh, iNaturalist. I'm not trying to um, call out anyone's problematic photographs. Sometimes that's the best shot you can get, but I'm just using these photographs to stress these are issues and why it's difficult sometimes to identify certain species or certain observations of turtles on iNaturalist. So the requirement to zoom in is, is a big one. And oftentimes it's just not possible with a, a phone. Um, maybe you zoomed in and this is the best you get. But there are many photographs observations like this on high naturalist and we can tell yes it's definitely a turtle there's a good chance it's a painted turtle but maybe it's a red-eared slider i'm i'm not sure and i wouldn't want to identify it without a better photograph sometimes it's possible to take a shot with your phone as a placeholder and say it's a painted turtle, but then if you happen to have a better camera with you, you can take another photograph with it. It allows you to zoom in and get a, a much higher resolution photograph. And then later on, you can upload that to your observation. So you've got the distant shot to establish the location and then the close up um, that really allows someone to identify that species. Of course, we don't always have the luxury of a camera with us, but Sometimes we do. Uh, and sometimes it's possible to take shots from different positions. So maybe you're standing on the shore and you can take a picture of this distant turtle, but maybe if you walk down the path a ways, the turtle may be closer to shore uh, from that angle and you can get a better photograph. So if you can take more than one shot from different positions, by all means, try and do that. And uh, another issue I've seen is that sometimes there's just a lot of vegetation between you and the turtle. The turtles picked a secluded spot to bask and it didn't pick a spot. Uh, so that was easy for us to take photographs of it. Uh, in cases like this, oftentimes you can kind of just move a couple of meters to the left or the right to get a different angle. And that can improve um, what you can see in each photograph and make it easier to see the head or, or something that allows you to identify it. 
Another problem that all cameras have sometimes is that they focus on something we don't want. In this case, it seems to be the background water as opposed to the rock with the turtles on it. Uh, this is likely a congregation of map turtles, but I'm not certain because the photograph is uh, fuzzy. So a good suggestion is always take a couple of photographs if you've got the time, just to improve the odds that they're one of them is in focus and nice and clear. And oftentimes the turtle's facing away from us. We get a photograph, we can see a limb, we can see the back of the shell and we look at it and we go, well, it's probably a painted turtle, but maybe it's a red eared slider. Am I certain? I'm not certain from this photograph what it is. And so taking a shot from more than one angle of the turtle can really improve things. Here's a shot from the side, which we can see it's clearly a painted turtle. We can see the red um, along the side of the shell, on the neck, uh, the head sticking out, which makes it really easy to identify. So when in doubt, try to get more than one angle when you're taking more than one photograph to make it easier for someone else to identify that turtle. In addition to basic photography tips, we, we should take into account the species we're taking photographs of as well. And uh, in Canada, nesting season for turtles is typically the month of June, which is gonna be starting fairly soon. And it's important if you see a nesting turtle, want to take a photograph either for your personal pleasure or for iNaturalist not to, to spook the turtle. Nesting is a very stressful time for turtles so please keep your distance. I recommend at least five meters away from the turtle and if possible stay behind the turtle so we're not getting in her face and, and disturbing her. So that's something to keep in mind if you see a nesting turtle. Sometimes you take a shot and there's more than one turtle on the log. Um, I'm sure we've all seen that. And sometimes they're all painted turtles, so it's just one observation for a naturalist. But sometimes you get lucky and there's more than one species basking on the log. So in this case, uh, this is one of my photographs. Um, I have a northern map turtle on the left-hand side and a painted turtle on the right-hand side. And uh, in terms of identification, I think side by side, it's very clear that the painted turtle looks very different than the map turtle. Uh, but I, I upload this to iNaturalist, how do I make it two observations? And it's actually very easy to, uh, to duplicate the observation and make one for the painted turtle and one for the map turtle. I find this is easier to do on a computer rather than on your phone. Uh, but if you call up the observation in the uh, top right hand corner, there's the edit button. If you click it, actually you click the arrow next to edit, my apologies. And by doing that, we'll bring up this little box that allows you to delete the observation. So don't do that, but allows you to duplicate the observation. And if you do that, it'll bring up this whole new observation. And it keeps all the important data. It keeps the photograph, it keeps the location, it keeps the date and time, and then you can simply add in uh, the species that you want the duplicate record to be. So if the first one was the map turtle, in this one you would type in painted turtle, and if you wanted to, you could add a note saying this observation is for the turtle on the right, a painted turtle. There is a another observation or the map turtle on the left. So that's one way to have two observations uh, from one photograph. So anyone who's traveled along roads, uh, particularly in areas where there's high, high numbers of turtles has probably found dead turtles on the road. And these are valid things to submit to iNaturalists. Um, they're gruesome, but they're valuable observations to document where uh, turtles are being hit on the road. Sometimes it's very easy to identify that dead turtle. 
Um, but sometimes this be, the, the individual has been hit um, and it's in very poor shape and it's really hard to tell what it is. In many times, um, if you flip the turtle over and look at the bottom shell, it may be in better shape than the top shell. And although we typically don't see turtles from the bottom, it turns out that the bottom shell is actually fairly diagnostic for most of our species. So to start with here, um, we have the bottom shell of a snapping turtle. And I think of it as being kind of diamond shaped. It's wider in the middle and narrower at the top and bottom. And so the, the bottom shell is quite small compared to the size of the turtle. You can see how much of the arm and leg sockets you can see. In comparison, this is the painted turtle. And you know, side by side, there's uh, easy to tell these two species apart. You can still see a bit of red here. Uh, the shell is oval. Painted turtles are fairly variable for the patterning on the bottom shell, but it's fairly straightforward to tell them apart from other species. Now, this is the bottom shell of a Blanding's turtle. And again, looks very, very different than the other two species. Uh, you can tell this is a fairly old Blanding's turtle by all the lines on each scute, this is the scute on the bottom shell. And so just like uh, growth lines in a tree or growth rings in a tree, uh, turtles, as they're growing, um, the scute grows and puts down extra, extra growth, and you can see those lines showing up. Of course, once the turtle stops growing, there's no more growth lines. And last but not least, here's a shot of the bottom shell of a musk turtle. And you can see it has the hard bony scutes, uh, but in between there's kind of connective tissue holding everything together. So it looks very different than the other species. So just as a, um, another piece of advice, when you're trying to figure out what you've got, if it's a dead turtle and it's not in good shape, um, take a photograph of the bottom as well as the top, and I'm sure someone will be able to ID it for you on iNaturalist. This is not part of um, observations on iNaturalist, but I, I feel like I have to add this as a turtle conservation biologist. If you are out there and you find turtles that have been hit by cars, they may not be dead and they need all the help you can get. Um, in Ontario, we're very lucky. We have a world-class turtle rehab center, the Ontario Turtle Conservation Center. And if you pick up that injured turtle and give them a call, they will actually arrange for someone to pick up your turtle and bring it to the rehab center, which is near Peterborough, and do their best to bring that turtle uh, back to good health. I also want to stress that even if the turtle doesn't look to be alive, it may be. So for example, some turtles are hit. Um, they may have gone into shock and they're unresponsive. There may be a lot of blood. Uh, but the turtle might be still alive, and it's very hard to tell if it's dead or just unresponsive. So please err on the side of caution and uh, try to provide help for that turtle if possible. Uh, no other province has a rehab center like the Ontario Turtle Conservation Center, uh, but a number of provinces have vets that will take injured turtles. So you may be able to find a vet that can help. Um, but I wish I had uh, a, a simple answer for every province in Canada, but I don't. One more thing to think about in terms of turtle observations is the eggs. And we're not going to see the eggs after the turtle has laid her nest, but as we probably all know, uh, nest predation is a serious threat for uh, most species of turtles. And so we can take an observation of a predated nest. So that's going to look like something like this, typically some kind of small hole in the ground and scattered eggshells. And it may not be possible to identify it to species, uh, but at least we can say, ah, that's where turtles are nesting. Uh, here's another shot of a predated nest. 
Um, eggshells look a bit different. Here's another shot where I've kind of zoomed in on the on the cavity. So there's eggshells still there, but they're broken open. So a nest predator like a raccoon or a skunk or a fox has, has gotten to the eggs. Uh, but this is still a great thing to um, add to iNaturalist. I'd also encourage you to, to zoom in and try to take a good photograph of the most intact egg you can find. Sometimes that can help to identify it. So for example, in this case, I know this was a snapping turtle nest. Um, most turtles lay oval shaped eggs, uh, but the snapping turtle is the only species in Eastern Ontario, which is where I am, that lays round eggs. Uh, the spiny softshell also lays round eggs. So depending upon where you are, there could be other species that lay round eggs. Uh, but by taking these observations, it's a way of documenting where turtles nest, and that's useful information to have. I put together a list of a few projects on iNaturalist that can apply to turtles or be um, might be of interest. Uh, first of all, there's Help the Turtles, which is uh, a project that uh, the Canadian Wildlife Federation has put together. You do not need to join this project. Uh, the project automatically gathers together observations of any turtle in Canada, whether it's native or non-native. But if you do join the project, um, you will get occasional updates from the project, not very often, I'll admit. Uh, it also allows um, CWF staff to have access to any, inform any private information about the location. So if you want to share that information with us, joining the project allows us to get that information so we can use that data. So for example, uh, where Blanding's turtles are being hit on the road would be something we're really interested in in terms of road mitigation. Another project that's of interest to people who are in Ontario is NHIC Rare Species of Ontario. NHIC is the rare species tracking group, um, the government of Ontario. NHIC stands for the Natural Heritage Information Center. So if you join that project, um, any of your obscured observations will be shared with them and the private location will be shared. Um, so again, the, um, the Ministry of Natural Resources can track where these rare species are found in the province. And that's worthwhile for, for planning purposes and development purposes and knowing where these species occur. Another project of potential interest is the Canadian Amphibians and Reptiles on Roads. That's a project I created a year or so ago. And it's for all amphibians and reptiles found obviously on roads. So that includes turtles, as we're discussing today, but also frogs, salamanders, snakes, lizards. Um, if you see those things alive or dead on roads, you can add them to that project, which helps us to track these species, find out which ones are most affected by roads, and again, looking for where there are major uh, roadkill hotspots for these species. Um, I've also flagged the Quebec version of the NHIC. Um, and they also track rare species in the province of Quebec. So if you're in Quebec, um, either visiting, taking observations in nature, or a resident, resident of Quebec, that, that project might be of interest to you as well. So just to wrap up, um, this could have been the beginning, but it's the end. Why submit observations of turtles to iNaturalist? And I think there's a lot of reasons. I've kind of mentioned a few as we've gone along. Helping to identify roadkill hotspots is valuable. Um, but a growing trend these days are, are scientists and other researchers trying to use the data from iNaturalist to answer important conservation questions. And so this past winter, um, our CWF staff working on the Turtle Project were trying to analyze data from iNaturalist about northern map turtles and map turtles that have injuries from being hit by motorboats. So in, in essence, injuries from being hit by propellers. And because there are so many observations of map turtles, we were able to do a 
basically a range-wide analysis across the Canadian range of the species. So in the map on this slide, the blue dots represent northern map turtles in Canada that do not appear to have any injuries from motorboats. But the yellow triangles represent injured map turtles with injuries that appear to be from boat propellers. And as you can see, it's very widespread across the province of Ontario and a few into Quebec. Um, so this is a neat way to make use of this huge data set that people are contributing to. So we're currently writing up these results and hope to have them published in a scientific journal as a way of documenting the fact that this threat is widespread. Without the data from iNaturalist, we could study one particular location, but I'm not sure how else we could study all of Ontario and part of Quebec to this detail. In addition, um, I think iNaturalist is incredibly important for tracking exotic species. I mentioned the red sliders, I showed you some of the maps. Um, we're seeing new exotic species popping up into Canada every year. And so taking photographs of turtles, particularly in suburban and urban locations, you might actually have a red slider among those painted turtles basking on a log. So it's another great way that I naturalist is important. And last but not least, um, actually making an observation of a blandings turtle in the province of Ontario can result in habitat protection. Um, the blandings is a threatened species in Ontario, and the provincial government um, protects wetlands with that species. So if you are the first person to take an observation of a blandings turtle in a certain area, and you upload it to iNaturalist, and you have joined the NHIC project, that observation will provide habitat protection for that wetland. So not only are you observing wildlife, you're actually conserving habitat by making those observations, if you're the first person to find that blinding turtle. Very powerful. All right, uh, that's my uh, survey of turtles and iNaturalist. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. And uh, I'm eager to hear what questions you've got. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dave. And thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we do have some questions and just a comment from someone as well saying that Hope for Wildlife in Nova Scotia also takes turtles uh, a lot. So good Great. to know. I'll add that to my list. Hey, uh, someone has asked, are there any turtles native to Alberta? Yes. Um, so I used to live in Alberta and in extreme Southern Alberta, you can find painted turtles and snapping turtles, but they're very, very rare. I've never seen them in Alberta. I have seen painted turtles in Saskatchewan, again, Southern Saskatchewan. Um, but if you're in Alberta, sort of like the Milk River drainage might be a good spot to find a painted turtle or a snapping turtle, but they're very rare. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question here. Do soft-shell turtles live longer than hard-shell turtles? That's a great question. Um, the, the maximum longevity of turtles is really, really hard to figure out. Um, so I don't know offhand what the maximum is for a spiny soft shell or other soft shells. I know for snapping turtles and blandings turtles, it's quite possible for adults to live 70 or even 80 years. So I, I, I doubt that categorically soft shells would live longer, but it's quite possible they can live as long as some of our other big turtles. But offhand, I don't know who is the oldest of our freshwater turtles. Great, thanks. Uh, the next question, I'm also really interested to hear the answer to this one. Can turtles vocalize? And if so, what does it sound like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so typically we don't think of turtles as making any sounds. Um, if you've ever come across one on land and it's been scared of you, it will pull its head back in. And by doing so, 
the turtle typically has to exhale all the air from its lungs. And so it kind of does a sound. And so it kind of sounds like it's hissing at you, but it's probably really just expelling that air very, very quickly. However, in the last few years, people have been discovering that we don't know as much as we thought we did. And people have put very, very sensitive microphones into the nests of a turtle. So this little tiny microphone around the eggs, the eggs are buried underground, and the microphone has detected very, very high pitched sounds that we can't hear with our own ears. And so it turns out that inside the egg, before the eggs hatch out, um, they're not hatchlings at that point, but almost hatchlings are making sounds. And it, it looks like they're communicating with each other in the nest cavity. And so perhaps they're saying, is it time to hatch? Is it time to hatch? And it looks like that there's a, a number of different sounds they're making. So it's not just a beep, beep, beep. There's a number of different kinds of sounds and certain sounds become much more common right before the eggs hatch out suggesting there is some kind of communication going on and then the eggs hatch and a whole bunch of hatchlings will emerge to the surface. So maybe there's more we don't know about uh, vocalizations that are just beyond our hearing range. I don't know. Stay tuned. Research is always finding new things about turtles. Oh, that's so interesting. Maybe one day they'll be on the sound recordings on iNaturalist. <laughs> Uh, so we have more questions. <laughs> when observing turtles during the day from the same area, should all counts be uploaded? And maybe I can help a little bit with this one too. So each observation on iNaturalist is just the presence of that species at that date uh, in that area. So if there's a bunch of painted turtles, for example, you only need to upload one observation for that day. Uh, would you agree with that, Dave? Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, if you, if you see one that looks very strange or injured, that's worth another observation. And you can always add in the notes something like, at least 25 turtles basking on logs in this wetland. And that way, there's more information there. But yeah, there's no reason to take a photograph of, of every turtle on every log. Great. Uh, how far north do turtles range? So of course it depends on the species and some of our species are real southerners. So the spiny soft shell is just found in southwestern Ontario and a little tiny bit south of Montreal. So it doesn't like it as cold. Um, so I think, how far north? Let's say in Saskatchewan, Painted turtles are getting up about as far north as Regina, which is pretty far north, and maybe not quite that far north in Manitoba for painted turtles. I'm not quite sure of the northern limit in Manitoba. And uh, in Ontario, which is where I am, so I apologize for always talking about Ontario, but um, they're found up. Painted turtles and snapping turtles are found about as north as the Algonquin Park and up towards the, the northern limit of the Great Lakes. So you could find painted turtles around Thunder Bay, for example, and even a bit farther north of Thunder Bay. So they're, they're found farther north than a lot of people would think. Um, as we go further west, of course, the whole province is further north. Um, so like I mentioned before, Alberta, mainly just the very southern part of the province. And even for BC, uh, BC would just have the painted turtle, and it's typically the very southern part of the province, the Vancouver, Victoria, a bit into the Okanagan Valley, uh, but not too far north. Great, thank you. Uh, we just had a question about the phone number for the um, Turtle Center in Peterborough. I was wondering if you could go back to that slide um, so they could have it handy. Thank you. There we go. And that's, I, I believe, a 1-800 number, I think. I'm not sure or not. Um, it's free to call. And uh, once nesting season is rolling, they're running 24 hours a day, pretty much. So they will tr 
try to respond as quickly as possible if they don't answer the phone. So I can leave that slide up for a few minutes if people would like. Great. Um, someone was asking, what camera do you use to get the photos? I saw we had one of your photos earlier. Uh, what camera are you using to get these pictures? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, there was the photograph of the map turtle and painted turtle on a log. And that was just a standard point and shoot camera with a pretty good zoom. I think it had a 30 power zoom. And that was probably taken from a canoe at a reasonable distance, but not a hundred meters away. So I was able to get a good shot. I, I don't have any fancy photographic equipment. Uh, most of my observations that I not are from my smartphone. And if it's from a distance, then I typically use the point and shoot and upload it later on. Hey, thank you. Uh, I do the same mix of camera and phone camera. Uh, just depends what's out there and how, how far away they are. Mm -hmm. um, is it okay to submit photos from previous years or does it need to be current? And again, I can, I can help with this one. Um, so you could submit any photos from any time, just as long as you put the date. So you can submit a photo from 2000, as long as you put that you took it in 2000. Uh, it's really helpful to have to have uh, photos from any time period so we can look at, you know, what was there, is it still there, that kind of thing. And Dave, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I would just agree completely with that and just add that you don't have to have the exact date. So even if you can say June, you know, 2005, that's great. It doesn't have to be the exact date because sometimes if it's a digital image, it's been changed over time or it may have been taken with a slide or a you know, film camera back in the day. I have a whole bunch of slides, which I've never uploaded to iNaturalist and it's just a big job. So if you have the approximate date, year and month would be good. Great, thank you. And I'm just gonna add something that um, we also have a turtle guide on iNaturalist and I'm gonna put the link in um, if you wanna take a look again and and Dave, Dave helped make it. So it's definitely a good resource. And we have photo guides on iNaturalist for a lot of other species too. So I've just put them in the chat there. Uh, and we also have a few more questions if you're still good to go. So um, someone here was saying that they have red-eared sliders in their pond. Um, should you remove red-eared sliders if you see them? And is there anything being done to remove red-eared sliders in Ontario? Uh, that's a big question. Um, there, there is a, an agency which is trying to adopt red-eared sliders, so get them back into pets as opposed to being in the wild. Um, uh, I, I haven't talked to them for a while. Last time I talked to them was, was probably last, last summer or fall, and they were at capacity at their at their center, they just can't even take in, they get far more requests for people to take sliders than they have people wanting to take big adult sliders. So it's a real tough problem. Um, so you can try to remove them from a pond, but then it's a question of what to do with them. It seems inhumane to kill them. It's not their fault they got released. Uh, so there is no broad scale response at this point. Um, I think I would tend to think about it more in terms of the location and other species nearby. So if you're in an urban area and it's a stormwater pond and there's two or three sliders in that pond and there's no other turtles, it's probably not as big a risk as it is if you found it in a national park where um, it's competing with our native species. And of course, the big risk with releasing these pets into the wild is we don't know where they came from. Probably most of them had good homes for a few years, uh, but maybe there was another aquatic species in the same tank and maybe it has some kind of pathogen which has been passed on to the slider and that might be um, deadly to our native species. So for example, right now in the wild, there is, are things called rhinoviruses, which are popping up 
They were first found in frogs, and that's where the name came from, because rana is a group of frogs. Uh, but it turns out that they're lethal to turtles. And in the US, people have documented a number of native species dying um, from these ranaviruses. So there's the risk that this slider that gets released into a national park could have something like this, which could kill our native species. And um, we're living during a pandemic. We know what happens when viruses move around the world. Um, it doesn't end well. And uh, so it's best not to release them. And if you can catch them and remove them, it's a good thing, but then you have to figure out what to do with it. That's the short answer, not the, the three hour answer. Yes, thank you. A very complicated subject indeed. And there's another question about radio sliders as well. Um, someone here said that they've seen crossbreeding between painted and red ear, and how can you report this on iNaturalist? That's a good question. Um, so I, I'm not sure I've seen any species or any turtles in the wild that I was sure were, were crossbreeds. It's potentially possible. Um, if you're not sure whether it's a pure painted, a pure slider or, or, or something in between, you can always just identify it as turtle. And then in the notes, put down, I think this is a hybrid between a painted and a slider. And then hopefully others can comment. Um, but it's never going to be identified because I don't think we have a category that's like that. I would stress that both painted and sliders are highly variable. And so it's possible you know, it doesn't have the red stripes and the, the, the slider is very, very dark because it's an older individual. It may look more like a painted, but it might be a pure slider. And it, it's probably not possible to say for sure that it would be a hybrid between the two. I also should mention that it's, there aren't many places in Canada where sliders can successfully breed. So I don't know what would happen to the offspring of you know, a male painted mating with a female slider? Would those eggs hatch out? If it was a pure slider, it would probably only hatch out in Victoria, Vancouver, and, and south of Toronto. Any place else likely that they wouldn't hatch out, but we don't know for sure. Great question, though. Yes, and for some other species on iNaturalist that are hybrids, they do show up. Um, but a lot of them are still missing because they still need to be confirmed by experts. So always have a look and see if there is a hybrid um, available on iNaturalist as an identification. Or, But as they said, they're not all there. So you can always put it in the notes like Dave said. Okay, um, so we have a few more questions and we will end up at one. So I'll try and get through as many uh, in the next couple minutes. So somebody said, what is one thing you wish people knew more about turtles? What a great question. Um, I guess I would like people to know how at risk they are. I think so many people think that it's unfortunate to see a few dead turtles on the road, but they don't realize just how catastrophic it is for populations. Um, unlike many species, raccoons or deer, which breed quickly and produce lots and lots of offspring, turtles are slow to mature, um, their eggs get eaten by raccoons, and then if you're a snapping turtle, it might take 20 years to be old enough to breed. That's a long time to avoid predators and, and not being hit by a car. So, and we also know that even losing one or two adults from a population, assuming it's not a very big population, is enough for that population to start declining. Whereas losing a couple of raccoons in a population would mean nothing to the population. It would bounce back very, very quickly. So turtles are at risk, they're declining, and they're very, very slow to respond to any positive changes to their populations. That's very important. 
And along those lines, we have a question from somebody who has turtles nesting on their property uh, and they're trying to prevent and other animals from who are not at risk from digging and eating the eggs. Is there any advice you would have on how to prevent this? Yes, definitely. Um, so I, I'll put a plug in for our website, helptheturtles.ca. And on that, we have a PDF you can download on how to build a nest protector. And depending upon where you are, you can contact another organization who might be able to provide you with nest protector, uh, but they're fairly easy to build. build. Uh, two by fours, make the frame, some wire mesh on top, um, some screws to put it together, and a couple of exit holes. The hatchlings it keeps the raccoons out, um, but the rain can get in, the sun can get in, and the nest is unaffected. So check out our website, and you can find the PDF for, for making the, uh, the nest protector. Great, thank you. Uh, do parent turtles leave their babies alone in the nest? So what kind of parenting style do turtles have? Yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, we always bring our own assumptions about what parenting is like. Uh, so for a turtle, if you're a female and you've got a bunch of eggs to lay, you dig a hole in the ground, you bury them. And then, of course, being a good mother, you bury your young in the ground. And then the female heads back to water. And as far as we know, she never thinks about those eggs again. They're on their own. Uh, the eggs are underground, so they are safe from visual predators, but of course, uh, raccoons or foxes with a good sense of smell can find them and dig up those nests. So turtles are not <clears throat> perhaps great parents, uh, but it's a strategy which has worked for over 200 million years, so we can't knock it. Great, thank you. Uh, we have what do you, um, sorry, do hybrid, oh my gosh, I cannot talk. <laughs> do turtles hibernate is what I'm trying to say. I'm looking at too many questions at the same time. <laughs> do turtles hibernate? Yes. Uh, yes, so it depends where you are. Uh, up here in the great white north, of course, we have five, six months of winter, depending upon where you live, and turtles must hibernate. So. Um, all our species are going to go to the bottom of wetlands or rivers or lakes, and they will be on the bottom. Um, there'll be water and then ice on top. Um, and because the water temperature is so cold, probably about one degree Celsius, their, um, their body temperature is one degree, metabolism is almost shut down. They're basically kind of going into suspended animation and they can survive the winter. Uh, as long as it doesn't get too cold and the pond freezes to the bottom, that can kill them. Or if it's a particularly long winter and they may be in hibernation for an extra long time, and that can put so much um, strain on the body that they can die from just a prolonged hibernation. Great, thank you. Uh, and we're out of time. So thank you everyone who joined today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And for all the wonderful questions. Uh, I'm sorry if we didn't get to yours. There, <laughs> there are quite a lot of questions today. So, and thank you, Dave, for the wonderful presentation. My pleasure. And uh, there's also another turtle webinar, which I gave last week, which I think is now up on the CWF webinar page. So if you're interested, you can check that one out and it may cover questions which were or more about turtles and less about iNaturalists. So you can check that out as well. And also our Help the Turtles website and uh, various blogs on our website about turtles. So thank you very much for turning in today. I hope you uh, are out there observing turtles and other wildlife and adding observations to iNaturalist. Great, thank you everyone. Uh, and have a wonderful afternoon. Yes. Bye-bye.